so with me right now is Professor Gordon Moskowitz of Lehigh University, also a McGill alum. And Gordon has expertise in many, across many different domains. He's perhaps best known, or one of the things he's known for is his work on social categorization and stereotypes. So he's very generous to offer me some of his time today to talk a little bit about his research on that topic. So to start off very generally, Gordon, first of all, thank you for, for showing up. My pleasure. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you could just start us off by broadly as a researcher, what do you think are the questions that most drive your work? Well, at the broadest level, I'm most interested in the question of how to mitigate or reduce stereotyping and prejudice. I've always been interested in those questions uh, since I was like eight years old. Uh, so uh, when I got to McGill, I realized, oh, this was actually a field of study that you could dedicate yourself to. And so at the broadest level, I'm interested in uh, why stereotyping is so ubiquitous and seemingly so easy for people to slip into, and then given that it's so easy for people and that they do it without realizing it, how do you control it? How do you prevent it? So I'm, I'm coming at it from two angles, sort of the categorization piece that you mentioned earlier, why is it happening so easily, but then the control piece, how do you prevent yourself from engaging in some behavior or mental process that happens outside of awareness and without your intent. Okay, so I think this it's self-evident to many people for why this is an important area of research, but I like to give all the guests this opportunity to put it in their own words. So specifically related to how people control stereotypes, why is it that you think that this is an important area? I guess, uh, as I said earlier, from the time I was a really young person, I felt that this was one of the great um, pandemics of uh, my lifetime. Um, and we see every five to 10 years or so, there's some horrific event that reinvigorates public interest in this topic and that's happening right now. Uh, but for me, it has always been a topic of that importance and has uh, just driven me uh, in my academic goals uh, for as long as I can remember. So. I, I just see it as, you know, the great social problem, not just of our lifetime, but, you know, <laughs> historically. Mm -hmm. um, group conflict, hatred, stereotyping um, is, is, to me, historically, this one problem that has stuck with humanity. And, you know, I don't think I'm going to solve it, but I think it's a worthwhile way to spend my days thinking about um, why it is the case that it's been so prevalent historically and you know what can we do about it and you know what uh given what we've learned you know it's only a field of study as you know and as your class is realizing it's, it's really only a field of study that's 50 or 60 years old in mm -hmm. terms of scientific study and what have we learned over 50 or 60 years that's actionable right uh that's very well put it's a very great advertisement for this class more broadly so i appreciate that uh, the paper that we read or we reviewed in class was about this idea of implicit stereotype control. So the notion that um, rather than it being a reactive force where people have a stereotype activated and they have to work against it once it's activated, there are some people who do this chronically or you can put people in a dispositional mindset where they're going to work unconsciously, you feel free to correct my terminology here, to make sure that that implicit stereotype isn't even activated at all because they have this larger goal of being egalitarian. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so my, I mean, reading this, reading this paper, uh, one question I had was, for someone who's reading your work and says, I wanna be that type of person and they're worried whether they are or not. Do you have thoughts on what type of experiences or conscious motivation or work crafts these chronically egalitarian people? Who are, who are these people? I don't particularly like to focus on the chronic egalitarian people because they are few and far between, actually. Um, hmm. You know, in the, in the studies where we've looked at chronic egalitarians, we've used measures that we've given to, you know, uh, you take a class like yours, you know, if there's 250 people, we, we give the measure to everyone in the class and we, we get maybe 5% of people who would fall in what we call a chronic egalitarian category. So these are, 
you know, left-leaning college students mm -hmm. who have quite explicit egalitarian goals, but very, very few of them, what I call chronic egalitarians. So okay. well, I like to focus on the, you know, the rest of us, what we can do to put us in a mindset uh, or what triggers can we set up in our environment that will cue uh, an egalitarian way of approaching a situation. Okay, so I definitely uh, want to- Yeah, if, if you want to become that type of person, I would say uh, it starts off consciously mm -hmm. and you have to quite explicitly set yourself goals, think about uh, the environments that you'll be in and what triggers in those environments can serve as reminders for your egalitarian action explicitly set up those links between your environment and your goals so so that consciously when you enter various situations you're ready to see those cues and act in an egalitarian way and hopefully over time it becomes habitual and you don't have to think about it and ultimately become through practice that egalitarian that chronic egalitarian person so i guess i want to return to this issue of what what can people do to set up their environment because i think there's some interesting questions about how we take some of the lab studies and apply them to you know our everyday life but frankly i you know i'm surprised when you said that so few people you would you would categorize as chronic egalitarians i wasn't expecting that response you know partly because when we give people a measure like internal motivation to control prejudice and this is a note to me future me to review that in class now um, when we look at how people, the distribution of answers on that, most, I think most often people are at 9.0, they're at, you know, I, this is a very important issue to me. And so to see that this disconnect between people who can have high internal motivation to control prejudice, but that same distribution doesn't carry over into chronic egalitarians. Can you explain why you think that is? Well, it, it's setting a very high bar, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't doubt, or I don't doubt, and, and I should backtrack and say, uh, you know, that's in two or three studies that I've run, I've seen it be so small. And we're, we set a very high bar for defining someone as a chronic egalitarian. Uh, our measure is typically just an open-ended response where we ask people to talk about any hopes they have for the future and they have to spontaneously mention wanting to rid the world of races, you know, those types of egalitarian themes. So, you know, maybe someone who has a different standard for labeling someone as a chronic egalitarian would find a higher number. Um, but I, I think we do hold a very high bar. But I do think there is a difference between just saying on either a modern racism scale that you have a belief system that's low in prejudice or on an internal motivation to control prejudice scale that you have goals to not be prejudiced. Uh, you know, those are beliefs, values, and goals that in the cultures that most of the students in your class probably come from, those are pretty clearly stated in sort of the founding writings of the countries that they come from. Uh, so these, these are norms. And so people are highly committed to being normative and expressing those beliefs. And I don't think they're just conforming. I do think they believe it, but there's a difference between simply saying I like something or I value something and having commitment. I think the word commitment is what's essential here, right? We all value all kinds of things, right? We, you know, each of us is juggling at least, you know, 40 or 50 really important goals at the same time, right? Uh, so, some of those are, you know, if you, if you think about a hierarchy of importance of your goals, some of those are going to be, you know, higher than others that you're going to have greater strength of commitment to. And I don't know that the, the measures that we use, like internal motivation, captures that really well. People are highly motivated to just say eight or nine. It's a nine point scale, I think. Is nine point, yeah. So I, I like that point a lot because it also brings into this question of um, a diverse methodological framework because it seems like you're uncovering some sort of psychological construct that if we only use something like self-report, something like the internal motivation to control prejudice scale, if you put it in front of people and say, well, do you want to not be prejudiced? Then they get some thinking, well, how could that not be a goal of mine? Most people will take that response. But if you give them 
you have a blank page and say, what's important to you? It's very different the amount of people who will just get there naturally and say, that the idea of being committed to non prejudice or egalitarianism is important to me. So it's a, yeah, it's a classic like dilemma for a social scientist there, right? It, it's much harder to implement and code. Yes. Uh, and often you don't have the time, you know, you're given 15 minutes to get in and get out. And mm -hmm. it's very useful to have those scales. Um, and of course I use them, um, but I don't know that they can distinguish between different degrees of commitment to egalitarian goals. Um, so I, yeah. I mean, so going back to something you said earlier, which was you're less interested on in focusing on the individuals and more interested in focusing on how people can create their environments to instill this egalitarianism. And when you read the studies, and they're very tightly controlled, nice lab studies, but things like counter stereotypical training, where you're literally just seeing things on a screen to say this group good, this group bad. That's a great something for in lab design, but maybe a little dry when you have to apply it to your own life. So stepping a little bit outside of the laboratory context, you don't have nothing you're saying now has to be empirically validated. I'm asking you to, you know, just off the top of your head. But what do you think some things that people could do in order to restructure their environment if they want this goal of being more chronically egalitarian? So I think this is obviously an extremely important question. Um, and I do think it's worth distinguishing that question from what the goal of the researcher is, right? Like for me, in the very first studies I did on controlling automatic stereotyping, I mean, we set up extremely artificial uh, circumstances because the question we wanted to answer was, is it even possible if something is happening automatically, the activation of a stereotype, if that's happening automatically, is it even possible to interfere with this so-called automatic process? So the goal wasn't to think about the long-term goal, which is how you can train people to best control prejudice in their day-to-day -day life, the goal for those early studies was simply, is the disruption of the categorization process or the implicit things that follow immediately after categorization, can you even disrupt those things? If the answer to that is no, well, then you have to you know, change your strategy for thinking about stereotype control. But if the answer to that is yes, well, then you can start getting creative about thinking about, all right, well, then what actually, what, you know, aside from the very artificial things we're doing just to test the limits of this question, what can you do to actually implement it? Now, I don't know, as a science, we've come that far, uh, right? I think a lot of the work has been laboratory-based, created in very artificial ways, just to try to figure out what the process is so that once you understand exactly how things work cognitively, then you can start to think about the question that you just asked me. Now, I'm not trying to duck the question. <laughs> they are both really important questions, but often the researchers who do this type of work aren't necessarily thinking about how to create an intervention. Uh, although in recent years, I think those two questions are really starting, as we know quite a bit more than we did 20, 30 years ago, I think asking both of those questions simultaneously. So to answer the question, um, I'm a, a big fan of perspective taking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, putting yourself in the shoes of another person, considering the situation um, that they find themselves in, uh, not just relating to stereotyping, right? But the classic work on attribution theory, which any students who've taken social psychology will probably know that people typically are bad at taking the situation of others into account and anything that can help people to consider the context in which other people find themselves is going to help them make more you know more rounded uh less dispositional generally and less stereotypic in this particular case uh types of attributions about others so i think perspective taking is easy for people to do it's natural for people it's very unnatural for some people uh but um, it is something you can teach people to do, and it is something for many people is natural for them to do, but maybe they just fail to do it when they're interacting with people who are very different from them. Uh, I also think, I, I hate to use jargon, but the work on implementation intentions, I think. We'll uh, go over that. We would have read that in the article probably. Yeah. Um, but I think that work is, is also extremely easy to apply in 
very effective. Uh, both there, there's a huge, uh, not just in the laboratory, but in all kinds of field settings, uh, work on implementation intentions that show that making very uh, specific plans that link a response to a particular cue in an environment uh, are very easily triggered and uh, help people achieve their goals um, with really dramatic effects. So to me, those are two that are, are very, I think, easy for people to carry into their everyday life, perspective taking and forming, you know, very specific goals, right? You can't just say to yourself, I value being egalitarian or, you know, I'm a moral person. Abstract goals like that, uh, as everyone knows from making New Year's resolutions, rarely uh, follow through to behavior. You need to, you know, supplement those with very specific action plans. Are you... Um optimistic or pessimistic about the application of technology to some of these questions? Do you think an app could make progress on these type of things? My mentor has an app, so I'm obligated to say. Ah, I see. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I am pessimistic in the short run, optimistic in the long term. Um, I, I think there is a, a real rush um, and I have become an old man somehow, because uh, it was just yesterday I was a freshman at McGill, but somehow uh, my hair's turned gray and I'm uh, one of those guys, you know, screaming at technology and telling you kids to stay off my lawn. But, um, but I, I do feel that the younger generation is a little too quick to try to extend lab findings to non-lab situations and make very large claims about what the science can currently do uh, because it, it gets a lot of clicks and it gets people mentions and uh, people pay them lots of money to say clever things. But I, I so I, I do think there's a, a little too much of shouting about our laboratory results too soon in the process. Like, I prefer you to have, you know, a 15 year body of work before you start, uh, you know, tweeting. <laughs> As a fellow member of the gray hair club, I agree with that. Yes, um, but that's an extreme position. And, and I, I do obviously think there's value in people out there shouting about our science because uh, it is also very frustrating to me that nobody knows that there's a whole field of scientific study dedicated to these problems. I read the New York Times every day and they have historians mm -hmm. and they have, uh, you know, scholars of African American studies and they have English professors who have all these wonderful, you know, valid uh, beliefs about the history of racism and the mechanisms of racism, but, but there is never a uh, social scientist <laughs> being represented and we're out there for several decades now actually putting those ideas to the test and, and trying to understand sort of the, the intuitive and counterintuitive things about how stereotyping and prejudice work. So I think it's great that there are people out there promoting the discipline, but I also worry that uh, we, we claim that we can do much more than we currently can. Not to say that I'm not optimistic in the long run that we'll figure this out. Well, I guess we're jumping right off of that. I think my last question, because you've been so generous with your time, is you know, looking 10 or 15 years down the road, what questions do you most hope that this area of research ha that we've made progress on in 10 or 15 years? Are there things that kind of keep you up at night that you say, we have this conversation again and you're so generous and willing to come back in 10 years. We really made a lot of progress on this. I, I do think I, I, the thing I just, you know, yelled about, uh, I, I want there to be real progress in applying the science to solving real world problems. And I, I know many of us, myself included, have started to turn our energies toward this. You know, some maybe have always had their energies focused on this piece of it, but I would really like there to be progress on the applied side. The Is there a, an applied outcome that you're most interested in seeing change in over the last 10 or 15 years? You know, I wanna see someone who studies Prejudice in the moment, the, the people self-reported prejudice or some sort of discriminatory behavior. Could you give me like a specific outcome you're really hoping to see studies on? Uh, well, I, I would love to see work in the health domain um, and in the financial domain. I would, I would like to see a reduction in disparities in 
health based on uh, gender and race. And I'd love to also see, um, you know, our science contributing to interventions that help to reduce those same types of disparities in the workplace so that uh, everyone has a fair share at success and promotion uh, in, in the workplace. So um, I, I know we all state that as a goal, but I would really like to see the science on the subtleties of racism and sexism um, find a way uh, to be, and again, I said, I don't want it to happen next year because I don't think it can happen in a year. And I worry about sensationalism and claims that, oh, we've solved the problem. But I think when you take a long view like the one you just gave me, right. I hope that after having spent a decade focused on explicitly trying to apply what we know about the cognition of bias to how people behave in real world settings and specifically understanding the, the very precise contexts people find them in, right? So bias in medicine probably is going to require a different set of interventions than bias in policing and bias in finance. And, you know, and, and there are people right now who are focusing on each of those tracks. And I, I think that's great. And I hope in 10 to 15 years time, we will have made real progress, not just in understanding the bias, but in changing the way people live their lives and the outcomes that uh, people get. Yeah, I think that's a really, it's a very nice answer. You know, it's, it's, it's this thing where we're, we feel like maybe we've built up a good laboratory based understanding at this point that we're bringing just maybe push the boundaries a little bit into addressing these disparities in the real world and we got to take the good and the bad when that kind of work happens so I think that's a that's a good point to raise that we could all be a little bit more tolerant of the pot of the weaknesses that come with some of this application work because uh, it's going to be hopefully the first steps in a much longer area of research so uh, that's also a commitment to myself to maybe be a little bit more tolerant of when I see some of this work applied in context that I'm less comfortable with knowing that it's the first step in, in a, lo a long line of studies, hopefully. It's extremely hard to do. Um, yeah. I, I've been collaborating with uh, Jeff Stone at the University of Arizona doing some, we've created interventions for medical students. I, I'll say, you know, Jeff put in literally years working with doctors, embedding himself in that medical community, the nursing students, the medical students, the the doctors on staff at the university hospital, living in that environment to understand what the pressure points are yes. for doctors and nurses, quite specifically where racism can occur that's unique to that field of study and you know, what you can do if you're someone in that discipline, right? And as I said, it's gonna be different if you're a police officer um, and you know, it's hard work. Like, as I said, Jeff spent years of his life just trying to understand the medical side of it so that we could then come with what we knew about the psychology of stereotyping and prejudice to see how it fits with that environment. And um, luckily the medical school was out west in Arizona and he had to do all that difficult work <laughs> I got to sit. Uh, and another lucky thing is uh, the, us, we members of the uh, Gray Hair Club can look forward to the future scholars who are watching this, maybe tackling some of these issues. Um, one thing yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I, I was literally my first day at McGill. Freshman year, first day, first class was Don Taylor's social psychology class. Wow. And I was 17 years old, and I decided then that I wanted to do this. Well, we got to thank the scheduler, I guess, because from that one class, from the first <laughs> class, who knows if you ended up with chemistry first, where we'd be right now. But uh, one thing I forgot to leave out of your introduction is that you've actually written a uh, textbook on social cognition uh, and I've read that textbook it's in the office that I can't visit and I really recommend it but just in this brief conversation now we've seen your really impressive ability to take these research findings and translate them into younger scholars so to an audience of younger scholars so I really appreciate uh, the time that you have so thank you Gordon thanks for asking me I appreciate it